For more on the donors' conference taking place in Brussels and on Afghanistan's economy at large, let's bring in Faisal Pervez. He's an analyst focusing on South Asia with Stratfor. Thanks for joining us today from Austin. It's my pleasure. Thank you. So, Faisal, World Powers raised $15 billion for Afghanistan on Wednesday to fund the country over the next four years. How do you think these funds are going to be used? Well, it's important to say from the outset to, to really add some context that on Friday, the U.S. will have been in Afghanistan for 15 years. That means that the U.S. has spent more time fighting in Afghanistan than they spent fighting in World War I and World War II combined. I mention that because that will help answer the question of how the funds will be used and why we're still talking about Afghanistan in 2016. These funds in particular are going to go towards development, women's economic empowerment, and health care. And while it is welcome news that the international community has given over $15 billion, the great challenge for Afghanistan still is that can the government, can the broken political system effectively channel this money and minimize the corruption? Well, Faisal, we're going to get back to the government's role in a bit, but $15 billion, it's a big sum. It does come with strings attached. Afghanistan needs to come through with political, social, and economic reforms. What do you think are some of the more contentious conditions? I think that among the more contentious conditions, and certainly what's going to be a bigger challenge for Afghanistan, for instance, is how do you develop domestic industry to fuel the economy? This is part of the problem that international conferences such as this one are trying to address, is that, for example, the Afghanistan budget relies up to 80% on foreign aid. And if Afghanistan is going to wean itself off that aid, then they need to start developing more of their sectors. And that includes, for instance, agriculture and mining. Mining is important because a U.S. geological survey has revealed that Afghanistan sits on about a trillion dollars worth of mineral wealth. And so these are some of the types of uh, sectors in which the country is going to have to try to invest some money in to gain some self-sufficiency. Faisal, you're absolutely right. Afghanistan has many natural resources. The economy, however, is hobbled by the insurgency and corruption. So what can be done to, to get these sectors developed? The agriculture one, also one that's dominated by the cultivation of poppy. So how can these challenges be effectively addressed? Sure. So the sequence in Afghanistan's progress follows the, this order. First, security, then development. So what you need in Afghanistan, number one, to develop any of these sectors, whether it's agriculture or mining, is that first you need to put a handle on the Taliban insurgency. And to do that, you need to have unity at the very top. Now, the Afghanistan government right now is run sort of on a compromise between President Ghani and Chief Executive Abdullah Abdullah. These two men have actually shown uh, some disunity, especially in the very recent past. So a prerequisite to Afghanistan's development in any area, whether that is political or economic, is that we see some strong, robust, and resilient unity at the very top of the government. Faisal, separately in the background, India and Pakistan have been wrangling over Afghan trade. India accusing Pakistan of harming the Afghan economy by blocking the Indo-Afghan trade deal. What are the details there? So this is a very good point that you brought up. We have to realize that in Afghanistan, there are a lot of competitions happening between different countries. And none of those competitions are more consequential for Afghanistan than that between India and Pakistan. Now, as you're mentioning recently, India and Afghanistan were accusing Pakistan of not allowing uh, Pakistan to, for Afghanistan to use Pakistani territory to conduct trade with India. Now, the challenge here is that for Pakistan, Pakistan suspects India's presence in Afghanistan because 
Pakistan and India have their historical enmity. So Pakistan's big concern is that if India gains too much influence in Afghanistan just next door, Pakistan worries that now you might have a potentially hostile element on both sides of the border. Yeah, certainly a difficult situation politically. Now, it brings the question, with the EU injecting $15 billion into Afghanistan, why is it such a priority to the EU and to the international stage? So for the e so there's two parts to this, uh, this answer here. Number one, the international community's primary concern in Afghanistan is that that country never be used again as a base to plot transnational extremist attacks. But for the EU in particular, a big concern is migration. So we saw that in 2014, about 38,000 Afghans went to seek asylum in the EU. Last year, that figure ballooned to 138,000. After Syrians, Afghans are actually the biggest asylum-seeking group in the EU. So the EU's big concern is that they want to try to stem the flow of Afghan migrants. Now, the final point that I'll add is even though the EU has been very careful in its statements to say that the $15 billion in aid is not conditional on Afghanistan repatriating migrants, we still right now are seeing that the EU and Afghanistan are trying to work out some sort of a deal in that Afghanistan takes back some of these migrants. Yeah, that indeed is going to be something tricky to negotiate. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much, Faisal Pervez, an analyst focusing on South Asia with Stratfor. Thanks for joining us.